Okay, so now uh, we're at the end of Rene Ganon's uh, Reign of Quantity, and uh, we've come down to the end of a cosmic cycle along with him. These last nine chapters uh, I read through this morning, uh, Tradition and Traditionalism, uh, chapters 31 through 40, uh, 32, Neo-Spiritualism, 33, Contemporary Intuitionism, 34, The Misdeeds of Psychoanalysis, 35, The Confusion of the Psychic and the Spiritual, 36, Pseudo-Initiation, 37, The Deceptiveness of Prophecies, 38, From Anti-Tradition to Counter-Tradition, 39, The Great Parody or Spirituality Inverted, and 40, The End of a World. Now, uh, it's not an accident, by the way, that there are 40 chapters. The number 40 has an esoteric significance, uh, not only in the Bible, where it's associated with the Hebrews and the Exodus wandering uh, through the wilderness, with Moses leading them over 40 years, um, and then Christ out in the desert, echoing that 40 days and nights out in the desert. But also, the number 40 uh, was anciently associated with the god Enki. <clears throat> Enki was the great Sumerian god who was the problem solver of the gods. He was the sort of Mercury figure, the, the figure that was in charge of coming up with all technological innovations. And he was also known as the Lord of the Watery Abyss, um, the abyss, the abyss, the Apsu, from out of which all things had come. And he is also a creator god. He created the first human beings. And his symbol was always the fish. And he later became Capricorn. Capricorn is the goat fish. The goat somehow at some point got linked with him along with the fish symbol. But he was always associated with the Tropic of Capricorn, whereas the other god Enlil, the air god, with whom he was constantly at war, as the watery abyss is at war with the, the heavens. Enlil was the air god. It may have become Yahweh by way of the fact that Enlil, as it migrates west to the Hittites, becomes Elil, and then shortened by the Canaanites to El. Uh, and may turn up in uh, the book of Genesis as another name for God is Elohim. So Enlil is, was associated with the Tropic of uh, Cancer, the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, and Anu, the high god, uh, was the god of the pole star. Anu's number was 60, the perfect uh, Sumerian num number since the Sumerians invented the sexagesimal numbering system, and 50 was associated with Enlil, 40 with Enki. Um, <clears throat> as the Tropic of Capricorn and then he becomes the, the symbol of Capricorn, basically the goatfish. It's interesting because there was a, astrologically, there was a stellium of seven planets in Capricorn in 1994 uh, that sort of kicked off this age that we're living in now. And Ganon in these latter chapters does indeed become very apocalyptic. He gets more and more eschatological as he goes along. Uh, he spends a lot of these nine chapters mowing everyone and everything down. Uh, anyone who isn't one of us, esoterists, has obviously gotten it wrong, so there's a lot of complaining in these chapters and a lot of branding of people as pseudo this, pseudo that, pseudo initiates. It, it, it's, there's a lot of complaining that goes on in this book, uh, and a lot of just mowing down of everyone. He makes anti-Semitic remarks about uh, Einstein, the fact that Einstein, Freud, and Bergson were all Jews, and he's wondering why these guys who are the creators of modernity, why are they all Jews? and that it may have something to do with their nomadism. It comments like this, uh, it's a very irritable, uh, sort of saturnine, choleric -y type book. Uh, it doesn't really get interesting until the last few chapters when he starts getting into his own eschatological predictions. Um, at first he spends a chapter mowing down anyone who, uh, most people who tend to make predictions and prophecies, the prophecies tend not to come true. Uh, in fact, that's usually the case. They, they usually don't. Prophecy is a tricky business. Um, and so he's kind of right about that. But then he makes his own predictions in accordance with the tradition of the Manvantara, the Kali Yuga, and what its structure is as it winds down to its eschaton. It's the bare bones bottom of the Kali Yuga with first, as we've seen, the creation of the cube of uh, modernity, uh, the purely materialistic scientific conception of the world as a kind of cube that has solidified completely with the erection of a materialist philosophy. Then the dissolution process that follows that, uh, where he says part of that will be all of these uh, pseudo-initiates uh, creating a counter-initiation and a counter-tradition uh, as false, uh, by which I take it he means that anyone who's interested in spirituality other than him and his pals in the esoteric movement um, the theosophists and mediums and 
people conducting seances and stuff, he sort of mows all of them down as essentially amounting to uh, a kind of materialism of spirituality or a materialistic spirituality uh, that will begin to dissolve the, the, the cube. Then he says it'll reach a certain point where the Antichrist will appear. And he says the Antichrist uh, is a being who will appear and who will set up uh, a counter-initiation that will be a false golden age. And he'll try to present it as a golden age, uh, maybe somewhat similar to the manner in which Virgil said of Augustus that in the fourth eclogue that he was inaugurating a golden age. So maybe something of that nature. There's a certain comparability here to Spengler, which I want to get to in just a second. And that uh, the Antichrist will erect uh, a, a short reign of a counter tradition uh, that will be false. I, I take it he means, I don't know what he means. Anyone who's not one of the esoterists, but by definition, since the esoterists are such a small, tiny little group, I don't know who they think they're. <laughs> this, well, they're, they're there's a lot of pot calling the kettle black in, in, in a lot of these, in a lot of his criticisms of, of modernity. Uh, then it gets down to the point where the Antichrist's reign will be, will pass, and then we will get the 10th avatar of Vishnu. The 10th avatar of Vishnu is Kalki, whose name means, uh, may mean a, a part of a machine, uh, hence his appropriateness for a manifestation at the end of the machine age. Uh, he's depicted as Vishnu in the form of a man riding on a horse with a sword. Uh, and uh, he says that the symbol of the Antichrist will be a lion, which is interesting uh, in a certain sense here. We'll get to in a second. And that the true uh, hero, the, the Kalki, who will be the 10th avatar of Vishnu and who will inaugurate what he calls a rectification, which will transform the malefic influences of the counter tradition into the new age of benefic influences of the, he's careful not to use the term new age, by the way, uh, since that's one of the things that he derides, um, a satya yuga, basically a new yuga will come in that will be a new actual golden age. And he doesn't really describe any aspects of it. It's except to imply that it will be a new form of authentic spirituality that will come in and begin a new manvatar, a brand new cycle. So that's basically how he ends the book. And I think there's some interesting comparisons with Spangler here. Spangler is one of these guys who did make prophecies that have come to pass and do seem to be on the mark. Uh, that's why I tend to stick with him uh, over the years here. Uh, 1918, he wrote The Decline of the West, and he came up with a morphological model for civilization, which has certain distinct epochs that are roughly about 400 years in duration each, something like that. And it's interesting because... Um, at one point, Ganon makes the comment that the deviation began uh, in this Kali Yuga period during the 14th to the 17th centuries, by which I presume that he means Western, those Western centrally, centuries. But uh, from, so that would be from 1300 to 1700 AD. Those are precisely the centuries in which Northwestern Faustian civilization attained its apogee and absolutely flowered with the production of all the great Western metaphysical geniuses from Dante to Goethe. Uh, that, that's not a deviation in any sense. That is a classical age right in there that is perfectly comparable to the Greeks during the 5th century BC in Athens with all the wonderful art and creativity and mentality, Herodotus and Aeschylus and Sophocles and all the great minds, Plato and Aristotle. We've got the same epoch that Spangler identified here as morphologically analogous that starts uh, shortly after Goethe, with, basically with Leonardo da Vinci uh, and all the fireworks that come along with these great geniuses, Shakespeare and Rembrandt and Goethe and Beethoven and then the German idealists who wind all of this up. And then it declines into materialism after them. Uh, that's in Spengler's model. So he privileges precisely the period here in Northwestern Faustian civilization that Ganon derides and dismisses as the beginnings of the deviation as he calls it. And it's only a deviation because this is when the Northwestern myth of the great Faustian individualist hero emerges who does not see himself as part of a tradition, but as a tradition unto himself, founded by himself. The mind of Leonardo da Vinci is a world unto itself. It is a tradition unto itself that belongs to no other tradition. All the way down to Goethe, these universal geniuses erect their own 
world as individual traditions unto themselves, which the esoterists, uh, particularly Kumaraswamy and Ganan, see uh, as an aberration. Uh, <laughs> they're most decidedly incorrect on this point here. And I think Spengler was correct when he identified that indeed, after the great German idealists, after Hagelin, Fischer, and Schelling, uh, we start to get a decline a bit with Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Philosophy starts to become less certain of itself. Uh, lots of doubt creeps in with Kierkegaard and lots of skepticism with Nietzsche and the nihilism that he helped inaugurate himself, but that he also identified uh, as a tendency that would come to prevail more and more. Yeah, that all does begin to sound a lot like what Ganon describes as a Kali Yuga, as a coming down to the end of a civilization when its great metaphysical uh, flower wilts, dies, and comes down to the earth. So now we have soft ontologies, as Johnny Vadimo calls them. The West can't get it up for truth anymore, apparently, in this decadent age. So this is the age that we're at. And I think some of the predictions then that Spengler made, he says that um, so we're morphologically analogous with classical civilization, with where that civilization was at, at about the time today, the year 2000, he marks on his chart as equivalent to uh, Imperial Rome, the inauguration of uh, under Augustus, or let's say Julius Caesar, right about that time as the Republic is beginning to disintegrate and uh, transform into a dictatorship. Uh, and with the transformation into a dictatorship, in comes what he calls the Caesars, and they are the builders of empire who represent autocracy and the shift out of the pol party politics uh, into, or the politics even of money into pure zoological power struggles in which everything, uh, as history winds down to its end, everything is decided by force, not ideology, not mentality, not this party or that party, but by sheer brute force. That's what the age of the Caesars uh, inaugurates. That's what they represent. And alongside of them, as they create this universal state out of zoological brute force, uh, a second religiousness, Spangler says, will come in. So he says, this is where we're at right now. This is what we should be expecting. What should be happening right now? The creation by the West of a universal state. And I think indeed America uh, can be slotted into the category there of ancient Rome. It fits quite nicely, just as the Greeks are quite com have a quite comfortable fit with the classical Europeans the continental uh, Europeans primarily, uh, but also, of course, the British. And, um, and so the second religiousness, uh, religiousness that comes in is the religiousness uh, that we saw amongst the Caesars with all the mystery cults popping up everywhere, uh, uh, the popularity of astrology and Neoplatonism and this group and that group. You had to be initiated into, one could be initiated into the mysteries of Isis and Osiris, and into the Eleusinian mysteries, make, make the trip back to ancient Greece and be initiated there. Uh, you can't speak about the mysteries, though. You have to remain silent about what you witnessed. Um, and then all these Mithraic mysteries for the Roman soldier. So it becomes religious once again after its after the period of its materialism with Republican Rome winds down, stiffens and dies, and does indeed solidify, like Ganon says. Uh, and then the dissolution, I think, that corresponds to Ganon's idea of dissolution is that second religiousness that comes in, or, or possibly the rectification process that he sees coming in. And the Antichrist figure is perhaps the Caesar, the Augustus figure, who ushers in what uh, Virgil represents as a golden age, but which Ganon would say would be a false golden age, uh, because it's the age of just sheer brute force. Although uh, I think Ganon likes the idea of, uh, of some form of fascism. Uh, he makes a couple of comments here near the end It'll be glad when the egalitarian democratic age has passed and new hierarchical forms of politics can come back in. Uh, so I think he, he would welcome some form of fascism coming in, um, or at least some sort of autocracy of one sort or another. So we get that, we get the proliferation of mystery cults, and I think that Ganon himself is part of what Spengler predicted as the second religiousness. We're already seeing it, we're already in it, um, and it is linked to everything that he derides as pseudo-spirituality, uh, pseudo-initiates. Uh, they're not pseudo-anything. They're part of the, the new religiosity, the spirituality that has been spreading through the past century. The New Age is merely one of its conduits, uh, but it's becoming more and more popular, and it is and will transform the material worldview. Um, and so I think um, 
as this process happens and the material worldview gets transformed, it'll be sublimated into something new. We'll see some sort of etherealization process coming into being out of all this. Um, so that's what Spengler predicts and how I see it mapping onto Ganon. There, there are a number of similarities. Um, Spengler doesn't predict a new Manvantara or a new age coming out of all this, but he does see Russia representing the next great civilization. He says that Russia has all along been stuck in a pseudomorphosis, and indeed the Russians took a very long time because they were conquered by the Mongols for two and a half centuries, which was sort of analogous to the Hyksos country, the Egyptians. It took them a very long time to get out from underneath the, the sort of Mongol pseudomorphosis, and then after they got rid of the Mongols, then Peter the Great, with the building of St. Petersburg, brings in a Western pseudomorphosis. So they have to deal with that now, which they, I think the Bolshevik revolt was really an attempt to break it up by force and get rid of it, even though it had to adopt uh, a communist Marxist ideology from a Western thinker itself as part of that pseudomorphosis. That's fading away. Spengler says that Russia is in a pre-culture phase now, right now, and a pre-culture phase, despite the megalopolitan uh, shell from the West that has covered it, a pre-culture phase is fundamentally always religious and characterized by deep piety. He says Dostoevsky had planned at one point to write uh, A Life of Christ, and he says if he'd done so, it would have been a true gospel, basically, because Dostoevsky is right where, with the writing of the gospels as the epos, let's say, of Magian civilization, uh, that's that's the birth of it right in there with the writing down of the Gospels. Um, and so uh, he says that Russia, it looks to him like Russia will be uh, the next great civilization that will go through its cycle as soon as it gets out of its pre-culture phase and moves on uh, into its springtime. Um, so that's Rene Ganon's uh, The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times. We've gone through the whole book. I hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, we'll tune in again uh, for another book at some point.